Welcome back, listeners, to Mosaic's Life in Canada's podcast. This is our second podcast series on person-centered care. Together we can do it, but it needs us all. Calling in from the UK is Professor Andrew Miles and Professor Sir Jonathan Elliott Asbridge. They are two senior officers and founders of the European Society for Person-Centered Healthcare. They are here to continue our panel discussion to talk about person-centered care and all its many dimensions. And so it's lovely to have you both on the line from the UK. Welcome. Great, great, great oh, you're very welcome. During their discussion on this podcast, they will be referring to several important points and conclusions within an article recently published within the new section on PCC, a major collaboration between the ESPCH and the top rated International Journal of Evaluation and Clinical Practice, JECP. We will be providing the link on Mosaic's website at www.mosaichomecare.com after this YouTube. So I think I'll start with uh, topic seven. I think that's where we left off from our last uh, podcast. And uh, I'm going to put this question out and see who's going to answer it. Um, how does the care context affect the definition of PCC? Um. Well, it does. I think is the is the is the short answer, and I think um, it's it's an, it, it's important really to state what we all know. In that, in that, um, health and social care systems are inherently uh, complex and inherently variable. That I mean, that is their that is their very nature. And so, the whole idea that a that a one size fits all definition of person centered care would fit every, all, all such contexts is is. Um, is, is, is absurd, uh, so to speak. And so you're going to need really a general definition based on what we all agree now, uh, including philosophers, so that's quite a, an achievement, um, uh, of, of what we agree are the core concepts uh, of person-centered care. And then we need to uh, particularize, if, if, you, if you like, particularize that general definition to the, to the nuances and complexities of the given care context, whether it's um, uh, whether it's a cardiology clinic, whether it's a it's a, it's a, a dementia care home, or whether it's an HIV clinic, or, and so on. So, it, it, in a sense, we have we we have we have a general definition. We we generally agree what are the core components, and we need to particularize them. Just really, just like in clinical practice, where general research evidence from clinical trials has to be particularized to the individual clinical case. And I think, um, and I so I think that really that 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 is. Mm, that is what we have to do. It's not a barrier, and it is challenging to do it, but it's not a barrier. In fact, if anything, it's, it's, it facilitates the whole field because as we learn how to do that, and then as, as we understand and look at and observe and measure and so on the outcomes, um, we're learning. Uh, and uh, a lot of this may be cross-applicable to other settings uh, uh, as well. So they're great opportunities. Um, but a one-size definition doesn't suit all contexts. We have to recognize complexity, uh, great complexity in healthcare, um, uh, linear and non-linear in its nature. Thank you for that. Um, I must say, I actually, uh, last week, I was asked to do a presentation, and it was on behavioral. I also brought uh, uh, an organization which was LOFT, uh, in Toronto that works with behavioral and we were asked to go to North York General Hospital and yeah. uh, we were asking how they implement person-centered care and it was quite interesting because we hadn't heard that what they're trying to do so they were quite interested in some of the information um, and presentation and they're really looking at the whole person when they're bringing somebody in and they're doing the assessment they're asking about that person their interests and hobbies and i think they're also having a board beside the um, patient uh, to write some notes down. Um, so I asked, well, how does that communication get disseminated with the other staff? And yes, they have team meetings, they're passing the information on. So it sounds like North York General is sort of stepping up and, and doing a lot more on person-centered uh, care. They also talk about family-centered care as well, but we'll get into that uh, later yeah, on. Yeah, sure, I think we're going to come on to that, yeah. Um, and to what extent are these different contexts problematic or supportive of the evolution of PCC generally? 
Well, I mean, I mean, in a sense, perhaps we've already answered that. Did, did you want to just come in on that? I, I mean, mean it, 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 rather than barriers, I think, in a sense, they're opportunities, aren't they, these challenges? I, th I think they are. The truth is that if you are uh, dealing with individuals, which we all are in the services that, that we run, we need to meet our clients where they are. Um, that's the starting point with all, all of this, because if we meet the client where they are, then we're able to, again, listen to the narrative where we're able to do a proper holistic assessment. Um, and we're, we're able then to tailor, uh, within the freedoms that we have, we're able to tailor the services and how we interact with our, our clients to meet their needs, not the needs of the organisation providing the care. And that's where I think this starts becoming um, very realistic because, first of all, you're able to provide the services the patient needs, um, the, the, the way in which the patient prefers, and that nearly always means you're going to get it right more times than you get it wrong. That therefore means that the resources you need to deal with it are probably tailored properly and will even out over the uh, over the the macro and ultimately from a from a, an operational perspective. You probably, and in my experience, you find you probably are able to reduce cost and therefore um, reallocate resources to those areas where you need more. So for my mind, take, taking the time to listen to the client or the patient, meet them where they are, affords you with the opportunity to, first of all, provide them with the best standard of care that meets their needs, but also, which actually usually means you get things right first time, because we all know that rework is the thing that costs money. And that's why, and I would say from an operational perspective, we always front load assessment resources so that we get things right. And then that means you've got a happy patient and family um, with very clear expectations as to what they will receive. Um, and that then means that they don't get disappointed or frustrated. So you don't have to go back and do much rework. I mean, sometimes you do because that's a natural progression of the yeah. condition. Yeah. But for me, this is this is always this just makes this completely makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, and I think it does happen over time. You know, getting more information. I know when we do our assessment, well, we're, we're um, doing another assessment, like more person-centered care, but it's that conversation over time. And as the caregivers are going in, you're finding out more. So you're adding more to uh, the communication to other caregivers. Um, and that's where yeah. our meaning of me comes in, that ongoing uh, conversation. Um, can you just explain, you, you spoke about macro. What, can you just explain what that means? Yeah, I, I think, I don't know how it is for you, but certainly most um, services, clinical, I'm talking about direct clinical services rather than social services here, are commissioned in a very um, broad-based way. Um, there are some um, contracts that have very specific requirements inside them, um, some of which just simply don't um, cut it with the with with the patient uh, because it doesn't fulfill, fulfill their needs. So you have an allocation, a macro allocation of resources, but within that you're able, in my experience, to be able to um, move um, move resources between patients if that is uh, going to be in the best interest of those patients. So that's what I mean by the macro. If you if you have the inflexible contract, you can. You can, by, by practicing person-centered care, you can make flexible what is inflexible, and therefore the, the customer, if you like, or the payer um, is satisfied because you're not consuming any more resources than they have to provide for you, but they're also satisfied that you're providing person-centered care to the people for whom they're, they're letting the contract. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty key stuff. Pretty key stuff, I think. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and are, I mean, there's lots of different names that we're using in North America. I don't know about the UK on person-centered care. So we have family-centered, we have patient-centered, we have relational-centered, we have people and family-centered care. So what is the terminology that we should be using? If you can explain that. 
it, 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 it can be very confusing. Uh, I think you have to start. I mean, you've got, in addition to, to the, 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 the sort of descriptors and, and cat categories you, you've just mentioned, you know, you've got, you've got user, you've got client, you've got customer, uh, person, uh, patient, family, child, uh, and then you mentioned people. I mean, the people-centered thing is generally an epidemiological term, uh, which sits not that easily with person-centered care. It, it, it's something the World Health Organization, being an essentially an epidemiological body, has come up with to talk about the health of populations. I mean, person-centered care is about the care of, of, of individuals, populations are made up of individuals and the nature of clinical care per se is to focus on the on the individual wherever that is that is possible i think that the basic um, situation the basic thing the the, the 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 underlying foundation as it were to all of these um, which supports all of these different different uh, titles uh, each of which have implications you know what, what is a client uh, what is a user what is a customer these these terms are generally thought of as having been imported from the world of business and are not necessarily natural um, uh, within the healthcare lexicon um, uh, really but the basis of all of them is is the humanistic character uh, of, of clinical care I mean generally you know uh, medicine for example is a is a human activity with a, with a moral character which employs science um, and, and only in part and is noble in its in its character. So really, I mean, I, I always understand healthcare as you know the humanistic basis as humanity uh, plus science. The modern understanding with the scientific community is that medicine has ceased to be a human activity in the way that it was, and now it's science. But it's a shame to lose the humanity sort of thing. So they would see it. I would see. I would see clinical care as humanity plus science. Um, um, some of my colleagues would say, no, 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 no. It's science plus humanity now. So <laughs> that, that is that is a, a philosophical argumentation. But it's the recovering of humanism, which we've lost a lot of in the last 120 years, as we've seen huge increases in um, in scientific uh, uh, progress. It's recovering that and resensitizing healthcare professionals to. The, the, the vital need for humanism um, uh, that, that is imperative. And so, it, so basically, uh, humanity uh, is, is the basis of all of these different um, all of these different titles, whether user, client, patient, or ideally person, because the patient is a person, the client is a person, the user is a person, the customer is a person. So humanity and personhood are the basis. Uh, that's the clear foundation. I think that's a good explanation because <laughs> Because a lot of people right, don't very, seem to. It's a very to, long one. So it's a very long one. Sorry. Because a lot of people don't quite, I don't know, don't quite get it. E even professionals or social worker, I, I don't know. But anyway, thank you for that explanation, and uh, I'll try and get that out to some of the contacts that I know. Um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, 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 I'm often criticised for it, and not everybody agrees. But there we are. That's the nature of but science I think and it, dialogue. dialogue. I think it's quite clear what you're talking about. Um, so I think, I don't know, we're talking into the stage four, which is a, an important part of this uh, four stage, is the ability to learn and to communicate learning to the wider system. Um, and much of the vision of PCC in terms of operational impact uh, may yet to be evidenced, yet to be experienced. Can, can one of you explain that? Well, I mean, I, 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 I've, got, I, I've got here uh, a, a note saying defer to St. To Saint, Saint Jonathan, indeed St. <laughs> Jonathan, uh, to, to defer to Sir Jonathan uh, on the matter of regulation of healthcare professionals, on the matter of codes of practice, and on the matter of um, transformational and servant leadership at the national and especially at the local level. So stage four, then, as we refer to it in um, in in, in your winter newsletter, um, really is all about is is 
is not not so much about philosophy, where where we 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 essentially worked out the philosophy of person-centered care. Again, some of the philosophers will uh, will disagree. Uh, they wouldn't want to put themselves out of a job after all. Um, and uh, we that's so really it's methodological development is key here, with with the general definition of person-centered care, which we can particularize to particular clinical settings, uh, uh, particular clinical settings given their variability and complexity and so on, um, it, it's methodological development, which is the key. Um, methodological development is all about delivery. Rather than sitting down with the patient and talking to them about person-centered care, it's, it's the doing bit. And to do it, you need methods. And the methods rest on sensible definitions, uh, which, which are specific to the particular case. And then once you've got your methods and you've validated them in the various ways that we validate methods, then you have to implement them. And when you implement a method, the, the research literature over the years has shown that, you know, you, you can work to implement a method, and if you don't work hard to keep that new method in place, it just disappears, it, 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 fall, it falls out of place. So that's where audit comes in. You, you have to um, uh, implement your, method, your methods, you have to then audit uh, the process of implementation and, the, and keep the, the, the implemented method in situ within the clinical service through continuous uh, audit. Um, it, it, people need to be trained in, in, um, in new methods and innovations, of course. So education and training here is key through short courses, through uh, professional doctorates, uh, and through the work of, as I mentioned, transformational and servant leaders um, uh, advocating at the national level and also at the local level. And perhaps also um, new emphases in codes of practice and uh, perhaps tweaking the expectations of healthcare regulation are part of this implementation and maintenance of implementation. And I know, and I know that I mean, Sir Johnson in, 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 in a multiplicity of different operational roles across uh, all sorts of different health systems, uh, including being an, being an arch regulator himself, uh, would would have a lot to, to say on on this on this point from his hands-on work. So, well, I, I think, yes. So, so we'll pass it on to Jonathan because I think he has quite a bit of input on this section. That, 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 that's a good cop out for me because um, <laughs> hand, hands on operational practice is, is not my background. <laughs> okay. I, th I think it always you have to be realistic and you need to start from where you are. Um, and of course, we do all work in services which are, and certainly in the United Kingdom, are highly regulated. Um, there are very uh, many. Uh, standards in place, which um, are many of which are legal requirements as well as being professional uh, requirements uh, against which you can benchmark your services. And actually, they are what I would call the bare, the minimum standards. So they're the, they're the when anybody ever says something is a legal requirement, that means it is the most basic uh, compliance that you need to to, to ensure. We know, uh, and, and uh, therefore, that we can organise structures um, and we can organise the service delivery models in a way that comply with those legal and those um, societal requirements that, that are set in place. But when it comes down to the delivery of a clinical service, um, you take for granted those regulations in terms of health and safety and in terms of things like equipment and all other practical things that you actually need. There are standards very clearly set down that need to be complied with at all times. And if you're in an effective organization, you would take compliance for granted because you would have very clear surveillance in place to make sure that if any one deviates from that, then that deviation is captured, that the uh, remediation plan is put in place and a corrective and preventative action put in place for any future kind of occurrence to prevent anything happening in the future. When it comes to the services that we provide that are clinical services, we're talking about human beings and we're not talking about automatons. We're not talking about automatons that provide care and we're not talking about all automatons to which we provide care. So we're not talking about parcels, we're talking uh, that get delivered. In our case, we're talking about 
very high cost medicines. We're not talking about um, uh, we're not talking about regulations as how you should cross the road. We're talking about very complex relationships. And th at the beginning, Andrew was referring uh, in terms of, of um, the humanistic principles. We in the world, but certainly in healthcare, we work in very complex adaptive systems. And you need to be able to distill down from the complex adaptive system to what a clinical or um, social in, uh, caring interaction is. And that's actually a relationship between two people lo along a professional continuum. That's right. And if the individual patient is not met where they are, right, I'm talking about patients again, um, and the individual clinician is, is not where they are, then there's a problem already starting because if you're not going to take the individual patient's needs into concern, then that person is at a disadvantage. And as we all know, there's a differentiation in power anyway in that relationship between a clinician and the, and the patient or their family. Okay, so we widen it to include the social milieu as well. The best way to get a, a well, uh, adapt patient, that patient's needs met is by having a clinician who is properly trained and has been assessed as properly competent to be able to make those assessments. Somebody who can articulate and document what it is they've captured and more importantly, able to explain that to the person that they are serving or uh, their family or both. So the development and training, an ongoing development and training of uh, of an individual clinician within this complex environment of, of care is absolutely essential, which means that you have a, con a, con a concept that we uh, very much embrace here, which is from, from novice to expert. And if you're taking what you need from somebody who comes into this, uh, this, this, this industry, if you like, of, of care and uh, social care, we need people who are in this day and age the, the starting point does not necessarily have to be hyper academic, but it does need that people need to have the ability to think and to solve problems and to make judgments which are based on evidence. Give me somebody like that and I can make something of them with the support of um, an educational uh, team and educational infrastructure standards. And we can turn that individual person into somebody who becomes a person-centered practitioner who, who grows in expertise. And one of the things that we're working on here is to try and invert the triangle, because I don't know what it's like in Canada, but in the United Kingdom, the more experienced you are, the more experienced you become, the more expertise you gather. Yeah. The only way for you to progress is to go further and further away from the patient. And what we're trying to do here is to invert that triangle so that the, mo the most highly qualified individuals are actually with the patients and are in those teams coordinating the care of those patients and guiding that reflective practice, which is the final piece of the jigsaw. So as you're with a patient and as you're with a team and as you're with a service, and it answers, I think, the question at the end of it, but how do you gather the evidence is, if you, if you use, I don't know, the reflective cycle that's described by Cole and others, you then start to identify what it is you're looking at, what is the evidence that you're auditing, what is that showing you, and how can you put actions in place to promote the actions that led to the best results. I feel I've talked much too long on this, but it That's is okay. basically down to an individual being given facility to grow as a clinician or as a carer and taking that family along with them uh, in order to provide the best care and capturing that through audit. And, and, and the other thing I'll just say as well, which is really important in this day and age is data. It's being able to use data to justify as evidence the need for change and development. So, we're, so, in, so we're, we're really talking about a, a comprehensive upskilling uh, of, of clinicians. Uh, so, um, from a, if you like, from a, a sort of basic techno scientific, legally competent, regulator satisfying level. Uh, to um, to a higher to a higher point in the sense to to a to a, to a um, 
that I enumerate, enumerate if you like, from that from that perhaps a lower denominator, so that we're we're talking about producing first-rate uh, yeah. uh, clinicians. I think is yeah. yeah, yeah. And what and also I think the individual or clinician or whoever's doing the assessment also has to have empathy and compassion. And how do you, <laughs> you know, um, because sometimes a lot of clinicians don't have that empathy. And I think I think what I'm seeing in the UK, I think to be fair, I'm seeing a lot of um, improvement in that way. Um, and partly, and I think I'm sad to say, it's partly it's because it is being mandated and I think people are challenging. I mean, if you look at societal change, I mean, I look at my children, you know, and they just simply would not put up with being spoken to in the ways that I think we have witnessed in our careers, people being spoken to. They just call it out and therefore people don't yeah, to be I, as bad as they were. Yeah, I mean, I think people, point. some people are naturally empathic, and uh, I mean, that's good because you have the starting yes. material already, as it were. Um, and some people are not naturally empathic. I mean, people people differ. Um, I think um, I, I think empathy. There's this whole business of you know, can empathy be can empathy be taught? Uh, can empathy be caught? And, and I think. Um, and I think this is one of the questions which will be addressed by um, actually a major new um, development in the United Kingdom. Um, uh, a very good uh, friend and colleague of mine, uh, Professor Jeremy Howick, um, has just been appointed director of the of the Stony Gate Centre for Empathy in, in Healthcare within the Medical School at the University of Leeds. And, and I'm helping him out there as a visiting professor. And one of the things that... Uh, that um, uh, that Jeremy will be looking at is how we can train people into empathy, how we can in, how we can increase the empathy in naturally empathic people, and how we can teach uh, empathy to others who are perhaps not naturally empathic, and all sorts of other things. And, and again, it's important, and I think we've seen this in medicine a, a great deal, is that when uh, me medical students go into medical school, they go in with high ideals, full of uh, yes. empathy. And then that's fine it's for the first year and then the second year. And then when they actually come into contact with patients in year three, the empathy scores or the studies which have been, you know, em em scoring empathy um, show uh, actually quite dramatic falls over mm. year three, four and five and six, if there is year six as in the continent and elsewhere, uh, in empathy. Um, those, those, uh, that research is very important uh, uh, because of that observation. It's a very important and worrying observation. But it's also uh, important because you can then, when you see empathy um, uh, scores beginning to go down through monthly scoring of students, you can actually get mentors to intervene and say, well, oh gosh, why is this happening? And, yes. uh, and, and so on. And I think, again, this is, this is important work that's, that, that's going on. So, so when you mention empathy and compassion and so on, yes, Yes, we, 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 we've seen major deficits in this over the years, and I think people have caught on to that, and I think people are now, um, are now addressing it uh, really quite seriously. I, says. I, I think the, the only the rider I'd, I'd add, which is, is I completely agree uh, with what's been said, is that that doesn't take away from the need that if, I, if a surgeon is going to take up my appendix, um, I, I, I don't know which I trade, uh, an empathetic surgeon who was very nice and helped me feel very comfortable then botched the operation or yes. somebody who actually may not do that, but actually is really good at taking out appendixes. So, yes. um, you know, so, it's so a balance. You, and, you, yes. So you, 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 you <laughs> must have. You must have technical scientific competence. Yes, we need uh, but to have. But, 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 but delivered within a humanistic yeah. framework. You yes, yeah. exactly. Um, <laughs> I'm, go I'm going to talk a little bit about social prescribing because here in Canada, there is quite the movement for social prescribing. Uh, I wow. know actually it did start in the UK, but uh, social prescribing, for instance, may be considered an instance of a humanistic framework addressing the wider set of needs and capacities that have impact on social, emotional and physical well-being. It is also an aspect of care that requires wider social buy-in and integration of health, social and community resources, as well as engaging with a wider set of leadership opportunities. Social prescribing started in the UK many years ago, I believe in the 90s, and is now growing growing here in Canada and BC and some areas of Ontario. The Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing, CISP, and through the Alliance Through Healthier Communities. 
Um, so, Professor Miles and Professor Sir Jonathan Ashbridge, can we discuss a bit on social prescribing? Social, there's social prescriptions as well, and PCC, and how they possibly interconnect. Can I just get well, what, I mean, what your from, thoughts well, are? Sure. I mean, from my own perspective, I mean, it's been a great development um, because it recognizes that um, that not all answers to uh, healing and uh, well-being are pharmacological or surgical in the, in their nature, um, and it's great to to uh, to recognise that. And the the the, the, the social prescription interventions are, are I mean, there's a great plethora plethora of them. I think there's a, there, there are two things, two weaknesses here at the moment. The first is the evidence base. I mean, social prescribing has a growing evidence base, but it's not. It's not so rigorous as to convince the most techno scientific of, of people that it's that it's actually useful, that they should invest time in it, uh, that they should learn more about it, and so on. So I think it, it, that much more work needs to be done in developing the evidence base of social um, prescribing, and we do have a national institute for social prescribing yes. in this country. Yeah. Founded many years, several years ago. There's also a difficulty. And that's called cynicism, which is very easy to have in healthcare, especially with the, the pressures and, and um, uh, the, 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 certainly the NHS and the health services everywhere are under. And the, 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 there's a certain cynicism I've heard expressed, which is, ah, oh, well, this gets, you know, this allows the GPs, the primary care physicians and others to palm the patients off to, to activities in the community. Oh, yes, and it's a lot cheaper, isn't it? You know, if, if um, social, you know, gardening and, and uh, community yeah. groups and uh, art uh, gallery tours and um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is cheap, isn't it? And, uh, you know, so there is that cynicism as well. And there is a weakness in the evidence base. And I think it's strange Strengthening the evidence base would act against the cynicism, but I think this is probably long haul stuff, by which, by which I mean five to ten years. I, well, I mean, that's my view. No, no, sorry, that's what I've heard and what, I, uh, yeah. and what I've seen and discussed with colleagues and so on. I think uh, I'd, I'd echo, and I think you put your finger on, 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 on it quite well, and I think that the, the Interesting thing about social prescribing, which is something I believe personally has been, is, is something we need in society at this time because societal structure has changed very much over the last 100 years and certainly in the last 50 years, um, particularly as we have more urbanisation, but also um, really since extended families, um, you know, became less of a norm in some parts of our population. I think if you look at if you look at some um, diasporas within the United Kingdom, you probably would not need the level of social prescribing for those groups as you might need uh, in others, simply because there is uh, much closer family values and support. Mm. So I think, in a way, this is something which I always refer to as um, as community development. Uh, I think social prescribing fits into community development yes. very much. And I think if you if you if you read the works of Margaret Ledwood and others who pioneered what they call radical community development, um, you find that actually what the GPs, who are the majority of the people who undertake the social prescribing or in primary care, what it needs is practitioners of community development, which are embedded within communities yes. who are yes. living within those communities, yeah. which are which which our primary care centres tend tend to be, um, but they're they're filling a bit of a gap. And what you find is that the fact that a GP can refer to a small volunteer group that might, as you say, be uh, working as gardening in an allotment of growing vegetables um, or walking together on yes. a regular basis for exercise and other things, local running clubs, other things, the, 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 this, all of this would be something in the past that a local community development team might be trying to do. Sometimes you find it in churches where a local church might outreach and start outreaching into the community and build communities. Um, we see that as well. But in terms of, I think in terms of um, social prescribing, that's almost of what I would call a secular community development initiative, mm -hmm. which starts putting people in touch with each other. And I think that going back to the research point, 
Um, I think that the reality is that we need to really start focusing on the research into this area. And the reason it's challenging is because when this government, when this country moved into austerity, which was after the 2008 banking crisis, all of such community development work was just cut. And the, the things like youth services and youth clubs were all cut. The idea being, of course, that they should be undertaken by something called the the big idea or something. Like that. <laughs> yes. Anyway, it was basically a complete front for cutting all services. Yes. And therefore, uh, and the people providing those services who are properly academically qualified to do the research. So this is a really important thing. We will not see the results of it for 20 years. Um, and unfortunately, p p you know, governments wax and wane depending on votes. Mm. Yes. So it's going to be down to individuals, individual people, who yes. are, are, are those who will set these things up. But for anybody who's interested in how to go about it, I would read the works of Margaret Ledwood and, and, yes. and research community development, because community development is also about supporting communities to advocate for themselves. So ultimately, they ultimately go move from being, um, from being subservient uh, victims to actually taking responsibility for their own communities. And, and always that turns into be something which is better from a demographic and an economic perspective. Yes, I, I mean, I mean, human, human beings, I mean, uh, 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 act to live in relationship to one another. We, we live in relationship to one another. Uh, a human being that is on his or her own out, out of that context is, is a lonely person. And if there is another pandemic to come, then yes. I, I, well, I think um, it's here. There, there may be, but it is, as yes, Jonathan says, it, it's here. There, there is indeed a pandemic of loneliness, yes. um, which, which, which you know, results in all sorts of uh, difficulties, anxiety and depression and hopelessness and despair and so on, all of which can be addressed by person-centered approaches, which, in, which include in the context we're talking about social uh, uh, prescribing and, and, uh, and, and, and so on. So from that point of view, it's, it's, it's a very, very important initiative uh, indeed, and one which needs to be uh, uh, rolled out uh, on, on the basis of evidence and, and continued uh, evidence collection so that the most cynical of people uh, can be convinced. Yes. I know, well, there is a lot of work being done here. Um, and, and I must say, I think Mosaic, you know, as Jonathan said it, you know, I guess it's based on that community or that organization that's taking that on. And and Mosaic actually is, uh, our offices are in a church. Our resource center is in a church. Our social programs are, are oh, yes. in a church. I, 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 was, I was going to say, I remember, I remember you saying yeah. this. Great, so, great um, so we're doing a lot, you know, and if individuals come in, they're getting resources, we're connecting them and the families to other organizations. We do follow through to make sure if there's any feedback from the family. So, um, yeah, so it's it's working out quite well, you know, a lot of the things that we're doing. Uh, and, and I think, I think, sorry, uh, I think just publishing what you're doing and also, you know, if there's any undergraduate or postgraduate students looking at community development, getting them to write some papers for you because you're doing, that's what you're doing, you're developing, and you could almost argue it's bordering on radical community development, yes. which is very exciting yes. to me. I yes. mean, you know, Jane, you know, thinking aloud, as it were, Jane, I think, um, I think this is something that we, sh we should have a presentation from you uh, in, in, we're, we're just organizing ESPCH7, the seventh annual conference and award ceremony of the, of the society. So this is something, this is something I'll, I'll put in uh, with uh, JT, Jane Teasdale <laughs> to, uh, to, to advise. <laughs> so uh, you're, 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 you're on the hook there. Okay. Um, thank you for that. But I, I also want to make reference to the first podcast that we did because, um, uh, Jonathan had provided a video 
Uh, so for those listening, uh, please go back to podcast, the first podcast, and you'll, you'll hear and see the video as well. Uh, there are several academic groups around the world advocating for PCC models and research. Uh, and one of the organizations that we attend once a month is the We Thrive Group. Uh, and this group is based on many different professionals, academics, researchers from around the world. Uh, some from Brazil, from Hong Kong, um, you know, just from all over. And they are discussing about person-centered care within long-term care. Uh, you know, still trying to get how, how do we do that? What is person-centered care? What is the meaning of person-centered care? How can we change? And, and you know that over COVID, uh, you know, here in Canada, uh, it was quite bad, our long-term care. I don't know what it was like in the UK, but, you know, our the staff within these long-term care, uh, there isn't enough funding. Uh, they're not properly trained in person-centered care. Um, so these are the things, there's no processes. So that is something that the We Thrive group is looking at and doing research uh, within that. Um, so I don't know, is there any other groups that uh, you attend or um, uh, that, that you know of or any other information? There's, I mean, I mean there's, there's, gosh, there's uh, any number of, of, of groups across the world. Um, what, what we found at the Society, I mean, the Society kicked off in 2013, as you know, and we, we, we're just putting in place our second 10-year strategic uh, plan with our, with our new academic uh, medical school partners in October. And um, yeah, what we found over the last 10 years is that, is that, uh, is that people have been working in specific silos, you know, in yes. the sense that some people have been working on uh, narrative as part of person centered care. Some people have been working on preferences, others on values, uh, others on um, culturally sensitive care, others on spiritual and, uh, and uh, religious care, others on psychosocial and psychosexual care, others on um, addiction, uh, it's, it, others on increasing you know, uh, education and training and compassion and empathy as we've already touched on. So that's what we've seen is that, is that, it is that, is that the work in person-centered care and, um, uh, is very siloed really. And um, one of the principal things that we've been, well, well, that we actually founded the society to do and that we, we're, we're really these we've been able to make progress with is, is, is bringing all of these people into, into dialogue um, so that they can begin to talk uh, to people outside of their uh, uh, coffee mugs, outside of their silo. Uh, and so on. So, there's a, uh, um, so the, and the field is the field is uh, developing uh, rapidly, but there are still areas of, of, of confusion. And there's a, and I think what we will come on to talk about it. Uh, there, there's um, there's uh, again, with, there's a great big methodological deficit. It's it's time we um, you know we, we 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 need to be developing methods. We need to be delivering person-centered care rather than yes. rather than just talking about it. Yes. Yes. I mean, the one is easy, it's easy to talk about, you know, doing it, measuring it, convincing economists and policymakers and politicians that it is really beneficial in terms of clinical outcomes, that it is really beneficial in terms of cost containment or cost reduction. Um, it, you know, these are the big challenges, not, not, not just talking about it. That's right. Uh, so that, that's what we've been trying, you know, to, to do with the society. That's been one of our main thrusts is to get on with delivery yes well i'm i'm so glad that mosaic um connected with the european society for person-centered Healthcare, and definitely you know listening to the both of you who are academics in this field um it's been very helpful to mosaic and growing our person-centered care and the meaning of me um it is very complex person-centered care within an organization you can't just say we're doing person-centered care and then everybody's just doing it. There's a lot of training, there's a lot of process um, uh, inputting into your systems. And one of the things that we've noticed within uh, the healthcare sector and even, even hearing from some of the professionals in the hospitals is that the software is still based on the medical lens model. Yes. Um, yeah. And organizations, if they're working on social prescribing, well, 
are they set up for more of that social prescribing and that person-centered care? And did that caregiver have a conversation with the client? You know, what was it? Did the caregiver go out? You know, what activities did they do in the community? It's not really set up for that unless you set up your own software. And it's continuous. It's it's the training as well. And it's not just saying, okay, we're all doing person-centered care. This is what Mosaic is doing. No, it's every month. It's providing education. It's doing the training. It's talking about it in your newsletter. It's talking about on it on podcasts. Um, It's getting testimonials from personal support workers and families on is person-centered care working? Is the meaning of me working? Do the caregivers feel that it's beneficial? And from the surveys that we collect from our personal support workers after the person-centered care training is that they haven't had any of that training they've had minimal in person-centered uh, in person-centered care in the psw schools uh health schools um but not to the extent that mosaic is providing them the education and the research and the follow-through and and having yeah. somebody on the team Um, Martha Miller that is dealing with person-centered care, that is listening to the families, that are connecting with the caregivers, that are providing um, the um, connection to the community, back out to the community, because that's also important as well. So um, we're still moving along with person-centered care and that social interaction and finding out about the hobbies and interests and the goals of that individual. Um, yeah, Jane, and Jane, you mentioned you mentioned about you know um, the, 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 the some of the systems in the larger institutions and clinics and so on being not really sort of fit for purpose. I, I think one one priority one priority in person centred care is to move towards a um, what might be called a person centred health record. Um, Jonathan talked about data before, the, the central importance of data and feedback and so on. And um, you know, I, th- I think it's probably fair to say we're not collecting um, as much as much data on on person-centered requirements of the, the, the of the patient, the personal requirements of the patient, to be able to act on them. Uh, and, and in that sense, we've still got a, a, a very um, uh, biomedical model in place. And, and uh, some work, some interesting work has been done here and it's ongoing in, in, the, in, in the States with the uh, patient-centered medical home, but there's a lot more to be, to be done. So, I mean, so person-centered health records are, um, are, are, are a big priority so we, so we can capture the needs of the patient because without capturing those needs, uh, those uh, personal needs, we, we can't respond to them. And if we can't respond to them, then our care is, in a sense, it's a factor of suboptimal. I think the other thing is when you're in the commercial environment, which is is the case, even if you're in a government-funded health system or in a you know in 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 health systems where there is a plurality of provision and a plurality of payers, um, the gathering of um, information um, which relates to outcome and relates to experience, I would add, of, of individual patients and service users is becoming increasingly important in order to build the case for resourcing and funding. And um, the, you know, we all know that the, you know, in a cash uh, constrained, uh, resource constrained economy that all of us are dealing with at this time, um, the, the evidence you need to demonstrate request for allocated funding has to be based on the opportunity to reduce the cost because otherwise you don't uh, you just don't get considered and one of the things we're increasingly using in our benchmarking of of effectiveness of our services are very simple methods such as patient related outcome measures uh, patient patient related experience measures um, I think when we're looking at the implementation of person-centred care, both of those are of interest to us. Uh, and there are very good internationally validated tools for uh, these things, which are, are uh, which you can pop onto an app if your if you if your if your service users are able to use an app or their families are. These are any at most times it's about four or five questions that you ask every day, and you track those. And we use them for our our patients who are. Uh, dealing with cancer, we use them for patients with long-term conditions. It's quite a good um, way of translating um, kind of subjective um, 
qualitative data mm -hmm. into a more quantitative report that you can add in as part of any submission that you might make. Um, and in particular, if you've managed to run a little pilot on an in, in, intervention, which um, you can demonstrate for us, experience is everything because that, that affects outcome. There's no doubt about yes. that. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. So I'm going to read, actually, I, I received a, a testimonial, I guess, from one of our caregivers. So I thought I, I would try and read it at small print. So I'll have to see how I make out. Um, and so it starts this. Uh, this was a letter to Martha, uh, which works in our client services division and works in the person-centered care side. So far, we did the Royal Family Crossword Puzzle. Since she likes to do word search and crossword puzzles, you can see the excitement from her, especially the category, which is the royal family. It gives more excitement to her while doing the puzzle. What I did was I read the questions to her, so both of us are involved during the activity. So there, it's sort of like a two-way relationship between the client and the caregiver. Uh, what I noticed while doing the activity was she's familiar with the family's members' names, but she is having a little bit of difficulty in the spelling of their names, and she's not very familiar within the new members, like the son of Megan and Harry and some other young members of the royal family, but otherwise the activity went well. She likes to stay outdoors when the weather is nice. She enjoys it especially when the birds are chirping, and she's very happy when she sees the squirrels chasing each other. She also likes to talk about her family and her life in Germany. She likes to listen to interesting facts, like my last shift with her, we talked about flowers, and I shared a rare flower that we have back home in the Philippines. And I showed her from Google how beautiful the blossoms of its flower, and she is very enthusiastic about that. She also likes to listen to classical music, and I'm surprised to learn that we have the same favorite musicians. It was Andrew Ryu, and we watched his concerts on YouTube when we get a chance like when the exercises was canceled during the Sundays when she's living in, she's living in a retirement home, they would watch it. She also told me that she likes to watch musicians lives concert in Toronto before, and she went to see many concerts together with her husband. Uh, this individual likes to join many of the exercise programs in the retirement home as well. And, um, you know, she, she definitely has minimal movement on both legs. Uh, and then, so it just sort of continues like that, but I thought it was very nice how the personal support worker took the time, and that is also documented. We also have a family portal that um, the families can go in and see what is happening. So it's not just based on the medical lens care or the showering or feeding or whatever, but it's actually doing and having conversation and meaningful conversation as well. So I just wanted to uh, highlight that. Uh, well. it's, it's, very, it's very, very beautiful, very beautiful. Nice to thank you for, for that. Thank you. Um, I think we call that theory into practice. Yeah. What was that, Jonathan? Yeah. Sorry. I think we, we described that as theory into practice. Thank you. So another question, what important person-centered care initiatives that you know of are currently being implemented across the world? Well, I mean, it's, I, mean I touched on this earlier, people are continuing to develop um, narrative-based uh, uh, clinical practice. Uh, we're understanding more, uh, we're understanding more and more how, how methodologically, uh, uh, which has the direct importance for education and training and so on, uh, to um, elicit the patient's narrative and uh, uh, narrative, yes, uh, elicit the patient's values and preferences and so on. Uh, how we can collect uh, the har harvest and capture uh, data on the personal needs of people. So there's a lot of work going on, um, but. The, 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 and I, I don't sound like a crack record here, but the key, the key thing is methodological development. Now, there's, you know, um, there's a, there's a lot of academic um, research going on, which results in publications of papers and books and promotions and all sorts of things. Uh, but what we need are, 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 are rational uh, methods, their implementation, the measurement of their outcomes, including the the, the, the cost containments and cost reductions, which are vital to to overcome cynicism and, and, um, and, and disbelief and so on. Um, so a lot of the work that's going on, there's a lot of work going on. It, uh, it, it's very good, it's very necessary, but we need to see a shift uh, away from solely intellectual scholarship 
within the universities um, in which academics are often self-interested uh, to, towards, um, towards a methodological development and delivery. Um, I mean, in, in, in the words of a senior colleague of, of ours, who's a consultant um, pediatric cardiac surgeon, you just have to get on with it. I Any think, comment, uh, Jonathan? Yeah, I think one thing that we're beginning to see, which I think is quite interesting, is in, uh, you know, as I said earlier, the United Kingdom Health Services is highly regulated. Um, I'm not that we're not always convinced the regulation actually leads to better outcomes for patients. Um, and I think that over the last um, two years, the um, the regulators have been shifting their their focus away from process uh, more into outcome. And um, one of the things that if that the regulators, the, the, the main regulator, which is called the Care Quality Commission, is now really focusing on is two aspects of the, uh, which I think underpin the principles of person-centered care, which is the, the I, which is about the person receiving the services, and the we, which is the way in which services collaborate together to provide those services for the I. Mm. And I think that there is a level of... Um, a uh, principle within those um, two concepts, or those those that concept of the I and the we, which can be leveraged to start looking at what because they're very at very much the early stages. They, they kind of hardly know what the uh, evidence is that they're going to be gathering in order to demonstrate whether whether there's a compliance uh, of that. And, and in our health service, you're re rated against four levels, which is anything from outstanding, which is the best, to inadequate, which is the worst. And um, there is a level of subjectivity in some of that. But the, the key, the principle of looking at the outcomes for the I and the we are, in my mind, something that we can perhaps leverage to start to promote not enforce, but promote the uh, the concept of person-centred care. So I think we have to wait and see, uh, but I think it's time to stop cutting bait and start to fish. <laughs> okay, thank you for that explanation. Um, so I just want to find out for individuals on the line, how would they gain access to the European Journal for Person-Centered Healthcare and your information uh, to find out about the European Society for Person-Centered Healthcare in the UK, your website? Uh, and so if you want to direct people to that, how would they do that? Um, well, basically, um, we have two websites, the, the Society website, the, 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 the European Society for Person-Centred Healthcare website, and then there's the European Journal for Person-Centred Healthcare uh, website, um, the, the, the EJPC, which is the official journal of the Society. Uh, both of those websites are under, uh, what is it, uh, not re-engineering, and are, are being revamped at the moment, and will, will be relaunched in at the beginning of October. Um, so in the interim, October of this year, 2023, um, in the interim, it's probably best for people to write to me directly at the email, uh, which perhaps you could put the email um, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in, in the sort of blur that you look okay. at. Okay. And, and, and that is individuals that's, um, uh, who may want to join the society, because we have, uh, we have membership levels of, of associate member, um, a student, associate member, fellow, and distinguished fellow, um, and uh, so people are welcome to to uh, inquire about membership of the society, um, as, as well as you know how to get on with the journal. Um, and then, of course, in addition to the society's journal, the European Journal for Person Centered Healthcare, uh, we just launched uh, a, a major collaboration with Wiley, the the, um, the, 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 the global medical publisher, um, uh, and we have this uh, new society. Um, uh, section on person centered care within the Journal of Evaluation in Clinical Practice, JACP, uh, and, and that really functions to uh, develop the JACP, which is about to celebrate its 30th birthday uh, um, and uh, very shortly. And um, also, um, then we, for, uh, from the point of view of the society, uh, we increase our, uh, our, 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 our reach, as it were, uh, publishing um, and advocacy reach because we are an advocacy body as well as a, a body as well as a, um, a scholarly body 
devoted to methodological uh, innovation and so on. So um, to, to me, directly, I think in the interim will be the easiest for, for, for your for, for listeners. Okay, thank you. And I highly advise organizations, individuals who are wanting to connect and understand more about person-centered care to look this organization up. So thank you for that. I, mean, uh, I, you know, I as, as you know, Jane, the society is, you know, is, is has always been very grateful uh, for for your for Mosaic's uh, sponsorship and so on. You know, we're very grateful for that, um, uh, indeed. So thank, thank, you. thank you for that. So we're coming to the end of our podcast, and uh, for both of you. Um, so I'm going to ask each of you, what burning elemental issues and takeaways from this discussion on person-centered care would you like to leave our listeners with? So we'll start with, uh, we'll start with Jonathan first. Thank you for starting with me. Um, <laughs> golly, there's so much, isn't there? I think the reality is that I believe that we can deliver person-centered care even in a cost-contained um, health and social care environment. It, it's down to individual people uh, because it's about individual persons interacting with individual persons. The secret is the education and support and development of individual people because at the end of the day, it's an individual practitioner who's able to make that big difference for the individual person that they are supporting. And I think your testimonial should be pinned on your website and yeah. flashed around everywhere because I think you saw the outcome of the education development and training you're giving to your teams yes. in order for them to practice in a way. Uh, and let me tell you, it did not cost any more money for that individual to interact with that uh, service user in a way that he or she did and uh, look at the difference it clearly made in the well-being of that person. Yes, yes. thank you. And I mean, I would say from my point of view, it's, 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 it's again, it's, um, uh, it's a reiteration, not really, of, of methodological development. Um, and person-centered care isn't going to be delivered by, by one um, medical specialty or by medicine itself. Uh, uh, neither, uh, 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 neither should I say perhaps slightly controversially, by, just by nursing. Uh, where, where it sort of all came from in many ways, certainly over the last few uh, hundred years. Um, but uh, it's, multi it's going to be delivered by, realized by a multidisciplinary team uh, working not, not just by the multidisciplinary clinical team, but working with economists and policymakers and politicians and, and chaplains um, uh, and so on. Um, what you might call, uh, and even and the pharma uh, pharmaceutical and the tech and health technology industries and so on, what collectively you would call the uh, healthcare ecosystem. Each one has a part to play um, in interaction and in active listening to the other. Um, and when that is occurring, um, methodological development is easier. Um, the implementation of methods um, will, will enable us to, to see how they're doing in practice and to measure the outcomes. The outcomes will be clinical, but they'll also be economic, which is, is, is important. I mean, it is well, it's vital. Um, and you have to be able to afford person centered care. I, I think, as Jonathan has pointed out on many occasions, you have to be able to afford it. Um, so, economic outcome measures are, are, are as important as clinical ones in the sense of implementation and development. So, methodological implementation and development, that's the, 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 that this is going to be the key education and training. Um, the development of national um, transformational leaders and the um, and the election and working uh, of, of local mentors who will then mentor the clinical teams locally uh, using mentorship skills, academic detailing, uh, enthusiasm, encouragement, uh, uh, and so on. So there's a lot of work to do. I think the way to us as a society is fairly clear. It's complex, mm -hmm. but I think we we understand what needs to be done. Uh, but it's complex, uh, but we are moving in the right direction. Um, I think person-centered care will be achieved. It'll be achieved through gentle evolution, yes. not, 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 in, not with the explosive uh, revolution that uh, characterized the evidence-based medicine uh, movement, which, which has moved hugely towards the person-centered model now, uh, for various reasons. Um, and uh, so um, we're all players, we're all players. 
We all play we a part. A little, we, we, we do a little bit. You do That's more. Right. That's right. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, different that's, organizations. Uh, there, there, yeah, there are there are a number of organizations. I must say, um, listening and and working and uh, presenting with the Loft uh, Community Agency. Actually, they're doing a lot on person centered care language, so uh, we definitely align with them. So that's why we're now, you know, speaking at hospitals and uh, so. Uh, the professionals and the nurses on the floors are in understanding and and using, you know, some of the the methods that we're doing and trying to implement that within the hospital. So that's pretty neat, I think. Yeah, um, okay. So final thoughts. We're at the end now. Thank you, Professor Andrew Miles and Professor Sir Jonathan Elliott Asbridge for being our guests and providing us with your insight on person-centered care. It is not every day that I can speak with individuals on this topic who have so much knowledge, experience, and passion. Uh, so I, I do uh, thank you so much for the two, you've done two podcasts, uh, first session and now this session. And uh, yeah, it's been incredible. And I'm always continuing to learn from both of you and what your society has done. And thank you listeners for taking the time to listen to our podcast today. Uh, for more information on the article, Person-Centered Care, Together We Can Do It, But It Needs Us All by Professor Andrew Miles and Professor Sir Jonathan Elliott Astridge, you can review this uh, article on our website, which is www.mosaichomecare.com. And thank you for joining us today. Till our next Mosaics Life in Canada in podcast, this is Jane Teasdale signing off.